You may notice some spelling errors occur as I work up this sketch. There's a glaring one. Capital. That's okay. I'll edit the drawing later. The main point to this graphic is to represent how capitalism acts like a voracious eater of life, like a voracious virus attacking every cell in its wake. It's been called a natural economy, but perhaps it should be considered instead an economy of disease and destitution. It preys on tragedy, trauma and innovation. It ruptures and wounds and then sends in the fixing armies led by the captains of industry. Hence the third industrial revolution being led by big tech, who in turn are attempting to rebrand big ag, big energy, big pharma, with greenwash, hubris, and increased mining and landfill technology. The third industrial revolution is the next phase of dominion ideology. Dig up, make money, throw away. Dig up, make money, throw away. In the face of this colossal ideology of waste and exploitation, permaculture can be considered a liberation ecology, a liberation ecology that is most effectively applied in the household and community economies. To grow a permaculture requires access to land, land that both claims us and informs us to work again towards abundance, but land that has also in many cases been subjugated to capital constraints and relations. It is acquiring the necessary access to land that is so problematic for permaculturists, especially when land has been stolen and capitalised upon. I've said before that in the short term people can, with access to land and permaculture skills and principles, transition from the capitalization of food, energy and medicine resources. These are all disease-bearing systems, though the bigger political project of land privatization, probably the greatest disease-bearer the world's biosphere faces, will require a broad societal movement. The tendency for permaculture to absorb and develop patriarchal economic forms is an ongoing and growing problem, enabled, I believe, by an uncritical blindness to how dominant cultural forms creep and a general lack of imagination to envisage and thus reperform ecological economies of place. This is in large part due to our industrial school system. Making money from permaculture gives the most amount of power in an industrial cultural sense to those in the permaculture movement that are advertising and spruiking the loudest, forever transitioning permaculture deeper into capital relations. Capital relations in all their forms are essentially underpinned by the more sinister and invisible or rarefied parent legalism, property law, commercial law, intellectual property law, etc. All forms that er erode the world's commons, privatizing land, privatizing economy, and privatizing story. I believe this erosion is largely in part because pursuing money is not only socially accepted in the dominant culture as a righteous activity, but because as a culture of uninitiated people, we remain in perpetual adolescence, to call on Tyson Yonkaporta, which the narcissism of money is so well suited to, and industrial schooling trains us for. Permaculture requires an emptying of monetized relations to be truly in service to the communities of the living. The central problem permaculture faces is how do we, as permaculture actors, enable permaculture to reach out as a truly alternative economic and cultural form without access to land? Or put another way, that people of privilege who have access to land seem to be the ones that are developing permaculture. Permaculture came out of second people's consciousness. Second peoples who understood that the dominant system was a system of disease bearing. Access to land is certainly a question of privilege. But I think it also gets down to how much of our week is serving capital forms, servicing debt, and how much of our week is serving 
new social, ecological and cultural economic forms, truly in service to building or rebuilding for first or second peoples, what Charles Eisenstein calls a more beautiful world that our hearts know is possible.